want to start with TV show or do you want to start with book? Whichever one. Let's start with TV show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> one thing that like is a small thing, but still happened is Adam Copeland, who plays Aries. Mm -hmm. He was interviewed recently and he said that he had read Sea of Monsters, like the book, um, but he hasn't seen like any of the actual like official scripts or anything yet, which makes sense because it would be too soon for him to be filming yet. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, uh, and they were talking to him because I don't know if you, he like um, surprised them during their Comic-Con um, panel. Yeah, I saw the cut. And he was, he had like a, he had like crutches or something like that, but he had like a huge cast on his foot. Mm -hmm. um, I think he hurt himself doing, you know, being the edge, like wrestling yeah. and stuff. And so people were asking him if that would mess up anything with being Aries. And he's like, no. And of course, like his answer is like, once, once I start walking, I'll be fine. And I can like, just keep going. And I was like, this is a very... A, like professional wrestler answer to this question. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, but either way, like just knowing that he read the whole like second book means that he definitely is going to be filming at some point, which is just fun. Mm -hmm. Um to think about the the main stuff with the TV show that came out was the scene that people saw them filming. <laughs> yeah. With Tyson. <laughs> Um, but before we talk about that, I want to also say that James Bobin, who is the director for episodes one and two, mm -hmm. um, he posted a really like gorgeous picture on his Instagram of them filming the the chariot races. And it looked like the chariot that he took a picture of was the Apollo cabin one because there was a giant sun on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but either way, I was like, Jesus Christ, that looks fucking beautiful. <laughs> it does. I zoomed in a lot on that picture, and it looks like it might actually be a statue. It's just really weirdly lit. Yeah. Yeah, so that'll be interesting. I definitely love that everybody reposts anytime any of the showrunners or directors yeah. post. So yeah. that's like the, the one way. I totally forgot that we saw that clip like since the last time we potted um yeah so I'm we can definitely to talk, tell it's I'm like to talk about that clip last because i loved yeah. it so very much <laughs> uh but yeah i love um oh the other thing you showed me mm -hmm. was i just like missed it was danielle Jalade, who is somebody that we're pretty sure is going to be somebody because dior mm -hmm. doesn't know how to shut up and <laughs> left like a comment <laughs> Where she says, like, I can't wait until you're up here in October. And we're like, okay, you're probably going to be someone. The other mm -hmm. day she posted about how she was, like, in the forest. And I remember you were saying, like, is that, is she, like, in Canada where they are? And I'm like, she could be because yeah, the thing that is, like, fun about it is um, since they've been filming for, like, I don't know, four or five weeks at this point, something like that, they're probably close to when they would be, like, switching to the next director. Because um, mm -hmm. at least how season one went is they had one director for like two episodes. Yeah. So like James Bobin did episodes one and two of the first season too. And so they're probably gonna switch to whoever is doing episodes three and four somewhat soon. Like it makes, mm -hmm. in my mind, knowing a lot about like production and stuff, they usually do like the big action sequences kind of like last. Yeah. Um, because they're so big and involved and and take like a bunch of time with like stunts and crazy shit like that. Mm -hmm. And so they're probably going to finish episode two probably soon and switch. And so I was like, it is conceivable that she would go up there if she like finalized her contract or something. Yeah. Or she would go up there to actually start filming whoever she, if she is somebody. Yeah. Uh, but either way, things like that always uh, makes us excited about anything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So we know that they're like basically finished with probably episode one at this point because of the, the like scene that got caught out on the street. Mm -hmm. It was Tyson carrying Percy over his shoulder and Annabeth like looking <laughs> mad and scared that he's doing that. Um, so it's, you know, it's when she kind of busts into the school that they're at. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I would imagine that that's probably a good place where they're going to cut episode one. They're going to like introduce Tyson. And probably 
have just like the um, dodgeball game and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, and the way the the big action sequence. The way they filmed season one too was like that they would go back and forth sometimes between just Mm -hmm. those episodes. Like, so they weren't really going back super far. Yeah. They do sometimes re, like, refilm things as time goes on. Someone just saw them filming in the, in the streets of Vancouver, Canada. Mm-hmm. Was, it was, it's so fun that we just read that book. Yeah. Because all of the scenes are, like, so well, like, in my head that, like, I'm like, I know exactly what scene this is. And that is yeah. so much fun. <laughs> when they uh, because I remember in the book after they fight the the angry Canadians <laughs> and the school is like threatening to expel Percy do something bad to Percy mm-hmm. but Tyson does just like pick him up and run out of the school yeah. and so the scene is so adorable because it's Tyson literally carrying <laughs> Percy yeah. on his back and I was just like oh my god and I'm like yeah if if I was his like older sibling, I also would just carry Percy around like that just to like try to protect him. Um, but it was so funny to like just adorable because you know we love Tyson. Yeah, <laughs> to see him like that, and the scene is basically Annabeth comes up to him with her dagger and is like threatening him. Mm-hmm. And part of the scene that's fun that I of course liked is that you can tell that Percy is yelling at her before he even gets down. <laughs> yeah like you see like his hand come out and he's like stop stop what what are you doing and then you see and it's it's like a fun thing because you obviously can't hear what they're saying but like the body language of walker when he's talking to daniel or percy or tyson where he's obviously like calming him down and like being like all handleless and then when he turns to talk to annabeth he looks fucking pissed (laughs) when he's talking to her and i was just like (laughs) I love it so much (laughs) and it's just so fun to see that and especially because they did say that during this season that they would start um filming things more outside like they said they weren't going to film everything on the Mm -hmm. the state whatever that the volume stage that's what it's called and so this scene would have been filmed on the volume stage and scenes like that was during the first season Mm-hmm. So it's more fun that they're actually doing that. So people get a chance to just like randomly walk by and see them filming yeah. <laughs> like that. And oh, one thing I wanted to just add on for anybody is I saw some people like like kids, like teenagers that were worried that they were somehow breaking some sort of law or something like filming them like that. And I just wanted to say, like, if they're not on like a closed set, like their own buildings when they're in public and you're just like walking down the street and you just see them you can film them and post it everywhere in the internet and okay. nothing will ever happen to you that that's the whole thing of how productions work is they put things up uh saying like something is going to film during this time they usually have like a code name for mm-hmm. what it is so that they don't have like mass amounts of people like standing there waiting to you know uh stalk the cast <laughs> yeah. um and so it, but they still have something up usually saying like they're going to be filming in this place for from this time to this time and that's like kind of the fun of when productions like this do film outside because if you see it and you see anything you can take however many pictures and video and things like that as you want yeah and nothing exactly. bad happened to you like i saw people like taking it down and i think and one of them posted about that that they were worried that they would get in trouble and it's like no as long as you don't like break into their like protected like studio buildings um which i really don't think any teenager is going to do that then as long as you don't do that you're you're absolutely fine yeah so like just don't be an asshole is the only advice like you know obviously like don't cross any lines film zoom in like you know don't try to get up in there but like it's totally okay they're in public yeah like respect the actors don't try to bother them don't try to get their attention don't do anything to like interrupt the scene and things like that yes we have so much time to be filming and things usually they don't let people get close enough for that to happen but you never know how loud people can get yeah like as long as you don't do anything like that they'll be they'll be fine and they'll just like let you do that because there's nothing they can do about that yeah and it just makes people more excited so it's like free marketing for them exactly 
<laughs> oh, and the thing from that scene too that just makes me laugh so hard is that t the their jacket. And so mm -hmm. in the scene, Tyson and Percy are both wearing the same jacket, but yeah. on Tyson, it's way too small. <laughs> like the sleeves like end like up here instead of down there like it is on <laughs> Percy. And it's like really tight to like his skin and it doesn't look like he could like button up the jacket. <laughs> and I'm just like, that is so cute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just love anything to do with Tyson. So I'm just so excited to see him do anything at all <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> same um, <laughs> it was just so cute to see i will never get over watching him just carry walker around like that <laughs> yeah and um daniel the guy who's playing tyson i mm -hmm. just like i really do want to give him a fair shot i know he's older than we all expected but i do want to mm -hmm. give him a fair shot yeah and he was just from the things you can see in that scene he was doing a good job and everything and i know just from watching the trailer of the movie that you ended up watching the whole thing of, mm -hmm. I know that it's he's he's like perfect for that sort of role. Yeah. And like in the end, I don't care if he's like older. It was surprising in the moment, but I honestly don't give a fuck. As long as he's actually good at Tyson and, and I don't think they would have given him the part if mm -hmm. he wasn't like the best person that they saw. And yeah. it, it also, you know, helps that he's a huge Percy Jackson fan as well. Yeah, like, that does help too. It's just like you're you're going to care a lot more about the part that you're playing when you're a fan of this instead of just somebody that's playing a part like you would anything else. Yeah, we've seen that with the rest of the kids so far, which like um, Rick said it during a recent interview where he's like, these kids are now my headcanon for mm -hmm. uh, my own characters that I wrote. Mm -hmm. And like the chapters that we read tonight definitely exemplify that because like as I'm reading now I don't know about you but like everybody has been done justice it's just like I think I need to see Tyson for it to fully sink in the same way mm -hmm. and I will say that when it comes to seeing things I think it's I think it's so funny how people have like zero patience <laughs> when it comes to waiting for like a trailer like I've seen people already like complaining that we don't have like anything more and I'm like they just did they did two huge conventions where they gave us a teaser trailer after only filming for like five days like that is mm -hmm. some epic like work those editors and like and Walker did like they weren't even filming the scene because they're now just just last week they were filming the chariot race scenes and so they just did that probably just for just for the trailer. Last time they started filming in like June and we didn't get a, a teaser trailer until like September. Mm -hmm. I think is when they put out the first teaser trailer and everybody had a heart attack because because it was Walker reciting like the beginning lines of the first book. Yeah. Um, I watched that trailer in a ridiculous amount of times and just cried for like two days. Oh. <laughs> um, it was because it was so good. I was it like, was. oh my God. Especially, I didn't even remember how bad the movies were, but I just knew how much better it was anyway. Um, yeah. But now I know for sure how bad those movies are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and so they have another, com not Comic-Con, another Disney event that's in Brazil. It's like the mm -hmm. D23 thing that they just did, but in South America. Yeah. And so they've already said that they're not going to send any of the cast or anything, obviously, because they would be filming then. Yeah. But it is possible that they'll send something and then end up just premiering a new trailer then mm -hmm. and put it out online for when it comes out for everyone to see. And yeah. it would make sense for it to be around that time. Yeah, that would make sense. They'd have a little bit more of those first few episodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was there anything else that came out? Nothing like I don't think they finalized any of the other contracts we're all waiting on. No, uh, oh, please. Chris Alvarez thing. Oh yeah, how did I forget about that one? <laughs> that was the one that I was like the most excited. Am I mixing up those two names? It's Andrew Alvarez and Chris Peckendorf, right? <laughs> it's Andrew Alvarez. Yeah, Andrew Rodriguez and Chris like. And Chris. Oh. <laughs> we're just like messing everything. It's fine, um, but basically. Um, we did we talked about this previously when we talked about grooming stuff but somebody uh, made a video on here talking about how andrew alvarez who played 
Chris Rodriguez in season one was being inappropriate with younger, like 14 year old fans who had fan accounts and was like mm-hmm. talking them for hours in his, in like DMs and like sending them videos of Charlie, who he's friends with in real life, obviously, um, mm-hmm. to, to like make edits. And I was like, that's really inappropriate. Oh my God. <laughs> like what, what is going on there? Can we stop like, the like 20 year old from grooming Percy Jackson fans or like attempting to anyway on on, like the internet and and it like honestly that also made me nervous about somebody like that on set with a bunch of like also kids yeah with like their extras that would also be the same age I was just like okay um but on the horrible reddit (laughs) that we still look at somebody posted on there asking like what's going on with him because he did literally his instagram account there is no posts there's mm-hmm. it's just empty it's like an empty instagram with sixty thousand followers it's the weirdest instagram i still like check it every once in a while just to see like if he says anything yeah um but somebody on that on the horrible mean reddit asked like what what's going on with him like he deleted all of his pictures that's really weird um and somebody replied and said that they that there was some video. Oh, we're talking about Andrew Alvarez, who plays who played Chris Rodriguez on the show in season one. Mm-hmm. That somebody was asking, like, did they fire him or something? Because he deleted all of his photos on his Instagram. Yeah. And somebody yeah. replied and said that they're pretty sure that he did because they saw a video online that was somebody like trying out for Chris Rodriguez, like recently. Yeah. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> like, sorry, sorry, Chris. Chris. Sorry, Andrew. I know that you really like Jesus because you're Mormon. This is really an interesting time to be Mormon. Yes. By the way. <laughs> They're all so mad about the Hulu show. So that's hilarious. But um, but yeah, I, that made me feel a lot better about that whole situation. And just the fact that Disney and the show did something about it when they obviously heard about it and was like absolutely not goodbye yeah Um, that's the response you want like shows and stuff to have to things like this so it was just very reassuring that they did the right thing i guess the day that he deleted all of his pictures he Mm -hmm. posted something being like everything happens for a reason (laughs) and i was like that sounds like i got fired yeah, because you're you're texting minors. That's why that happened. That's the reason. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully that is what happened. I mean, he hasn't been on the show enough that like, I mean, he was introduced as the character Chris Rodriguez already, but it was what one episode that he made like a couple minute cameo at most um so yeah Yeah, it was like episode two he was hardly in it at all like most people didn't wouldn't even know who he was unless you're somebody who's read all the books like his stuff is more important for like future seasons that Mm -hmm. they need to recast him for those seasons but when it comes to right now they could easily just replace him with somebody else who is also hispanic since that's his character and and move on and and it's one of those things that nobody would care (laughs) yeah yeah um okay and then i think that brings us into the book which like as i i said already it's so easy to picture the kids in these scenes especially grover aka arian like just when he's jumping up for artemis i i feel like i could definitely see him doing it (laughs) yeah I, I picture as soon as I watched the TV show, I just started picturing all the main three cast, especially as um, their characters. It's I'm like trying to not picture Charlie that much as Luke because I don't want to be afraid of him. Yeah. And I that sounds ridiculous because I'm 39 and he's a 20 year old child, but that's just how my brain works with people like Luke. And so I try not to picture him that much, but I still still see him in my head when I read the scenes with Luke too. But I try, I like actively try to like make it more blurry. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I can still like enjoy him and not have that be too aggressive of a thing. Like, like I can't watch Adam Driver because he was Kylo Ren. 
I like I get like freaked I get like freaked out by him and I don't want that to happen with Charlie because he seems like a much nicer person. I think I told you mine is Jake Gyllenhaal because maybe I'm getting this wrong. No, it's not Jake Gyllenhaal. It, Josh it's Hartman. Andrew Hartman, I think, from the movie O. Oh. <laughs> and yeah. So there's just certain ones that I can't ever do again after seeing them be a villain. And what I've done, like, I know I made a, one of my little clips was about grooming and Luke being a groomer. I was like, okay, it feels messed up to use Charlie's picture for this because he's an actual person outside of this character, which is why I use the character art. Um, it also feels like a weird kind of thing to do because like the character art is a blonde white kid, but yeah yeah that's, that's why I, I, I use his pictures but i only use the ones of him like the the photos that they put out like before the show came out to use yeah. for that because it's him just in character and so that's the only thing i can really do because it is weird i don't like using the at this point i just don't like using the old art for people that have been cast already on the show mm -hmm. because that's who they are now yeah uh, this one it just bother it this is a like a very like fandom specific thing but it just annoys me that people still make fan art of the characters with like the book version of them it just mm -hmm. I, I just don't like it like like i don't want to see white annabeth anymore <laughs> or like yeah. white luke or or any of the other characters even percy with like dark hair is like so weird i'm like who the hell is that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, it, I've seen people cling to, oh, well, Annabeth was supposed to be about pushing past the dumb blonde thing. We've been past that. <laughs> like, yeah, that's such a 90s stereotype that I would say the movie Legally Blonde crushed already in pop culture. Yeah, and, and it's also just like, so it's such a simplistic sort of issue to have mm -hmm. compared to a lot of the other issues a lot of the other kids have when it comes to stuff like that, that... Yeah that it's like, that I get why um, at the time Rick thought only came up with that because that was more of like a thing that was around in media in the early 2000s. But society has progressed a lot <laughs> in the last 20 years and it's much more interesting for her to be a black character and to deal with that because people don't listen to black girls especially ever. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely is her still breaking a stereotype. And it's, yeah, it's that people would just underestimate her just because she's black. Mm -hmm. That's way more interesting than everyone thinks I'm ditzy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I'm a pretty blonde girl. <laughs> oh, no, everyone's nice to me because I'm good looking. Shut up. <laughs> it's such a small problem. <laughs> Man, if if the only problems I had in my life was things like that, my life would be so easy that I would like break down and cry about how easy it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So there are so many more scapegoat moments that I just like. I was reading and thinking, I am so curious what you're gonna say. And like, mm -hmm. literally, we start chapter seven with one of them, which is after the oracle came down like on its own it didn't magically go back <laughs> like on its own it um grover and percy were the ones somehow given the responsibility of carrying it back so i just wanted to see what you think of that right off the bat like, of all people it's percy like hi i was just electrocuted three times but i gotta get up and and after being electrocuted where my skin and my clothes are burning to carry the oracle up because nobody else can do it <laughs> like out of like thalia can't do it like her her clothes are just wet otherwise she's fine besides the fact that she's irrationally angry but yeah other than that it was just of, like of course of course somehow percy is the one that ends up carrying the oracle's little weird body back to its room <laughs> with oh my gosh, yeah with um with grover the the part with grover after that was there's like a theme in this book so far that i remember but i just can't remember it better now mm -hmm. of 
things like life just like starting to change for Percy in one way or another. Yeah. And some some of the ways it's not necessarily bad. It's just different. But it's a thing of like he it's you can tell that he like doesn't really know where he fits in with anyone. Mm-hmm. Like, anyone really. Um like the stuff with Sally comes up later on, but just with Grover like it was sad to read Grover being like forgetting that like Annabeth was kidnapped almost because he was so focused on wanting to go back out there to like look for Pan and was way too busy being a stalker to the hunters. And yeah. and so it's that whole thing of this is the other like best friend that Percy has at camp and he's just like too preoccupied by other things to like really pay attention to what he's how upset he is or like what he's going through and isn't there to like help him or like assist him or back him up in things in the same sort of way and it made me like sad and like a little bit upset at Grover to like read him being like that of being like so distracted by his own stuff that he's not even like thinking about like what what this person that he's friends with is going through and it's it's frustrating because that usually doesn't happen with Percy Like, usually he's thinking about what other people are feeling, like, too much. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he doesn't, so that kind of thing doesn't happen that much with him. And so it sucks to read the people that he does trust a lot, um, like, letting him down in that way. Yeah, um, like, the thing with Pan and him, you know, getting back to um i haven't been able to search for him and all of these ancient spirits are stirring now um what got me with that is just he does immediately go to like oh yeah grover thinks that he's going to be the one to find pan it sucks that he's stuck here and he doesn't even feel like any of this that like his friend you know is thinking not about annabeth yeah it's the other thing with this part that I know we talked about before we even did this is that Percy just says like a one-off line of, oh, everyone at camp is going to be really mad at me because it's my fault that I lost, that we lost capture the flag. And it, no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's not his fault at all that he lost, that they lost capture the flag. He's He's the one that tried to salvage that very terrible plan. Like, like mm-hmm. we didn't really talk about that one line, but the one thing that um, Thalia says in the previous chapter when she's yelling at him before she starts electrocuting him is she's like, oh, is it my fault then? And it's like, yes, it is. Yeah. Like you came up with the plan and the plan didn't work. So yes, correct. It would be your fault. Like he wouldn't have to move his position and do what he did if your plan was working right. And yeah. but of course, she's not going to admit something like that, but it's more of a thing of um, I, I just like reading books like this with a certain perspective where when you're reading it, you're like, child, that's not true. Yeah, it's not actually your fault. Like, it does remind me of the way that I think about myself, though, like every freaking week of my life when I'm in therapy, my ther- I'll say something and my therapist will just give me a look. <laughs> or like sometimes I'll just like hear something and I know, and like you even will say something to me <laughs> and I'll just be like, yeah, I know that I'm being really hard on myself. Like I'm aware at this point, most of the time when I'm being too hard on myself, but I just like do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Cause it's just like how I think about myself. It's hard to like under, like think differently about yourself. Um, but it is one of those moments where when you're reading the book, like Percy in his perspective, he thinks that it's his fault that this happened, but that's not right. (laughs) Like he's an abuse scapegoated kid who's taking the responsibility because he just does that. But that, that's not actually right though. It's not actually his fault. And it sucks that, you know, no one was really able, like part of the whole thing of reading the books versus watching the show is that a lot of the thoughts he has inside his head he doesn't share with other people Mm -hmm. and so it's not like he told somebody like i feel really bad because this is my fault yeah just accepted the responsibility and didn't even it didn't even enter his mind to like talk to somebody else and be like did i do something wrong is it is it really my fault because he just assumes that it's him 
um, which is a very scapegoated thing. Like people usually have to point out to me when it's not me. Yeah. I just assume that it's me, that I've done something wrong. Um, like even the whole discussion we had about people harassing me about Artemis, Mm -hmm. It was the whole week I was like, what did I do wrong? And you're like, nothing, you're just autistic. <laughs> and if people can just tell more that you are by the way that you communicate than you than they do with me. And I was like, oh, I just, just like, I spent like all week thinking that it was my fault. And you were like, no, it's not your fault. <laughs> it's just this other thing. And I'm like, why didn't I ever think of that? And yeah. it's because I just assume that it's my fault. <laughs> yeah, with Percy saying it's his fault, like, the reason it's such a, um, like, we have evidence that it's an unreliable narrator moment in the fact that the streak has been so long. Like, I don't think anyone was even thinking of it that way. Like, nobody was thinking, oh, we had a chance, you know, or um, we could have won this had only Percy stayed where Talia put him. Nobody was thinking that at all. Everybody was probably like, yeah, we don't know if we're going to win this. We don't have that many campers right now. It's winter. Like, we are outmatched, but we're going to just do this for fun. And, um, like, of course, the Aries kids took it way too seriously. But um, I don't think anyone was thinking of it like that. And the only thing I have to compare it to is my high school we do a um thanksgiving day game which like i mean making high schoolers do that now kind of sounds kind of asshole-ish but it's a long-standing tradition because our high school plays another high school that are the two oldest high schools in san jose so it's a long-standing rivalry and like our saying has always been um because the games are called big bone for some reason and there's like a hypothetical bone that's the trophy um oh, okay. you know bone stays home um and so because it's like our streak has gone on for decades and um so like it's basically that's the home of the award i don't know why we keep doing this but like <laughs> you know that's how it's gone and um i have to imagine that those kids from the other high school are going out there like knowing we're a little bit outmatched, like definitely different ranking than those other football team. But this is just for fun. This is a San Jose tradition and it makes us feel good. So, um, you know, they're probably not mad at any particular person of like, you lost the game for us. Mm -hmm. The version of that for my high school was we did powder puff games, mm -hmm. which is where girls play football. Yeah, And so we would always play against another school by us. And that team, that game every year around homecoming was just like fun. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anything serious. Like, yeah, you're competitive, like you always are. But it's more just like really fun to go to a game like that and watch the girls get to play and things like that. And so yeah. it's not some like capture the flag is more serious just because the kids doing it are all actually like training for like literal war scenarios. But <laughs> It's not supposed to be something that bad. And like we said in, in the last episode, if Thalia would have just worked with Percy, none of that would have happened instead of her trying to do everything on her own. Yeah. It comes to reading these books again, I like to point out the times when Percy's perspective is like skewed because I think that people are aware of it. Like it's like a joke in like the general fandom that people make about how everyone else's perspective of Percy is like, this is the best fighter I've ever seen. I thought that he was a god because of how powerful he was. And his scenario is like, I mess everything up. Where's my mom? Yep. Annabeth, make me some cookies. And so like, it's so different. And so like people know that, but I think that sometimes people almost simultaneously also forget that when they're reading the books for moments like this. Because it's like, I think that people read these books where Percy said, oh, it's my fault that I lost Capture the Flag. And so they just like took that and were like, oh, okay, so it's it's Percy's fault. And it's like, no. <laughs> yeah. Like, let's think about what who Percy is and why he would say that and how that doesn't actually make sense for what actually just occurred just now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, um, and then immediately after they get the Oracle back, we have the scene, you mentioned this last time, where Talia is still so mad, she does the, I'm not speaking to you, so I'm going to speak to Grover, 
even though you are literally right next to him. So immature. Oh my yeah. god. Which like, Chiron I... like says later. He's like, that's part of the reason I wouldn't pick her, but yeah. Getting ahead of myself. Um, but yeah. yeah, so she's coming to to Grover and Percy because they have to get together all of the heads of houses. And Percy's literally the only Poseidon kid, so he's a head of house. And the way she says it is like, unfortunately, that includes Percy. And I was yeah. just like, I will punch you. <laughs> like, I'm not actually going to do that, obviously. <laughs> but that's just like the feeling I get when I remember, when I see stuff like that, because it's like, it makes me remember so many people who did stuff like that with me growing up, like not even just my sister or my dad, just like keep kids at school and that happened so even as an adult <laughs> that still sometimes happens where people just like don't like me and I'm sitting there like I don't know what I did um but you hate me now and I'm not really sure why but um autism that's why <laughs> but oh that's literally what usually what it is yeah um but at least for me and but that that scene is just so just like childish and the thing that i always as an adult especially i remember wanting to do this when i was younger but especially now that i'm older and i know that i'm right about this i always want to ask people in situations like that what are you mad at him about mm -hmm. like what do you think he did wrong where you are so mad at percy that you won't even talk to him when he's standing in the same room as you asking you a direct question like, are you, the thing you're mad about is that your plan didn't work and you're taking it out on Percy. Exactly. Like, that's what you're actually mad about. Because what else could he possibly have done that was such a horrible of a sin that you would not even speak to him and think that it's an unfortunate thing that he's one of the kids in charge and you have to talk to him. Like, do, do you forget that he saved the world twice in the last two years? Yeah, while well, you have been a tree. While well, you were a fucking tree? <laughs> And that like there were times when he could have this is like a thing i i didn't know how to like exactly phrase it right i i, I think i made a TikTok video about it but i'm not sure that i said it right because it's like a sometimes i have like ideas but i'm not sure how to say it out loud for other people to understand what i'm saying mm -hmm. but like when i think about the capture the flag fight and then i think of like thalia we're on titan's curse um and then i think of like thalia in the beginning of everything like the story of when she got turned into a tree i'm like that's mm -hmm. basically the same thing yeah like when she got because when she got turned into the tree i was like she didn't have to actually do that she could have run into camp and she probably would have been fine because camp is right there but so i always was like i feel like she just like gave up because it would be easier to have the control of being able to like sacrifice yourself instead of taking the chance that it won't work out and i'm like that's literally exactly what this situation was too was that her like her plan didn't work and so she just electrocuted somebody a bunch of times because she was so mad that it didn't work and it's like it's a it's such a golden child thing of like if my plan doesn't work and i don't get to be the especially because she sacrificed herself and that made her into like the ultimate like demigod hero figure where people are giving percy shit for years being like you're not as good as thalia and it's like she's not even alive anymore <laughs> um yeah. but because she sacrificed herself that somehow made her into like this ultimate hero figure that was better than him at everything um for unknown reasons <laughs> and so it's that whole thing again of like i was just thinking like yeah a golden child would rather die and then just admit that their plan wasn't working and they needed help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can I can 100% back that up. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Um, so um, they assemble a council, which includes the hunters, um, specifically Zoe and um bianca seems to be now her assistant and percy notes some changes so like it's maybe it's more like a twilight vampirism type thing that happens to the hunters where the transformation it's like she's getting buff and stronger but like she hasn't been doing anything she's been sitting around in the hunter's cabin probably yeah it it is thank jesus that rick riordan is not mormon 
Mm -hmm. Did it make them sparkle? Well, actually, he did. Don't doesn't <laughs> he say they have a glow faintly? Okay, glowing is fine. Yeah. <laughs> like that's kind of like a thing you see in a lot of like sci-fi fantasy stuff where the godlike figures have like an like a visual like aura to them to show the differentiation of when they become like a mortal or something. Mm -hmm. I'm just like picturing what it would be like if they literally like sparkled like Edward did. Oh my gosh, <laughs> does. <laughs> um one thing that i noted that percy said about um bianca was that her eyes vaguely reminded me of someone famous but i couldn't think who and so um because this is kind of our first introduction to hades kids which i know is a spoiler mm -hmm. but um i i was like what came to my mind is that a commentary on like hades kids tend to get famous or is it a commentary on who potential parents of these children are i think it's um about hades because mm -hmm. every once in a while rick will say that um some famous person or something mm -hmm. or he'll make up like somebody in this world that's famous is you know a demigod or something mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that it has something to do with that, with that some Hades kid is some actor or something somewhere. Yeah. Where you would have seen them because they're, I just know that they're like biological, their mom wasn't like anybody like that, that anyone would really know from what I remember anyway. I don't yeah. think so. Interesting, because it's more like the association with wealth, but it also kind of has an air of the making a deal with the devil kind of feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially because she's, you know, she doesn't really know. She doesn't know what she's doing. Like, <laughs> she's 12. That was like the one thing in this scene that was like very, I thought was nice to see Percy like feeling bad for her and remembering what it was like when he was 12. And he was suddenly going on a quest, except, you know, when it was him going on a quest, he was the one that had to be in charge of it. And everybody was yelling at him about going on it. Um, this version of it is a lot easier for her, but it's still like a scary thing that she's in this room with all these big, powerful, like the people who are in charge at camp. Mm -hmm. yeah. She just literally got there like 10 minutes ago and doesn't know anyone and doesn't know how anything works, but she's somehow here anyway and is supposed to be able to like keep up with everybody yeah so with this quest basically what the cabins are talking about is um who is going to be going with them they know it has to be five and so they decide on a three to two split favoring the hunters and zoe says i want to take some girl named phoebe who um the stole brothers right away are like Oh, that's the girl who like ambushed us at the end of Capture the Flag, right? We have a t-shirt for her. Um, and um, then she also says she wants to take Bianca. And yeah, Percy makes a note, I was that same age when I went on my first quest. She looks so scared. This has got to be terrifying. Yeah. And well, one thing I, I we talked about before we did this, I wanted to make sure we said is, well, one thing I thought about is that some of the head of the cabins are so young mm -hmm. um like selena is the head of her of the aphrodite cabin and she's like 14. okay in this book and because she was 13 in sea of monsters and um and then like uh the stoll brothers aren't that much aren't that old they're like j around the general age of percy mm -hmm. they're like a year apart but yeah like they're t they're <sighs> They're the head of the cabin. Um, they took over for for Luke because mm -hmm. Luke is, you know, gone being a horrible person. And so they're the ones that have become in charge because of that. And it, and like Percy's 14 <laughs> and like granted, nobody else is in his cabin, but still it's just they're so young to be the, the ones in charge. That becomes a more a bigger thing, like as the books go on, how young the kids are that end up in charge of their whole cabin because the other people in their cabin uh, die. Mm -hmm. And so there's nobody else to do it but them, um, especially Apollo. My God, there's a certain point where a character will that ends up with Nico much later on. He ends up being the head of the Apollo cabin and he's 13. Oh, when geez. He it because everyone else who was older than him died. Oh, my God. Literally nobody else. Like he's the one in charge of, of like, 
helping everybody with like injuries and stuff at camp and he's a 13 year old because all the other older kids all died so he has to be the one to do it and it's just like those little details that rick puts in to show like how brutal this sort of world is to these kids that all of these kids are like at an average 14 mm -hmm. and they're the ones to decide who gets to go to potentially save annabeth's life and yeah. have that huge responsibility on them um the one thing from this scene that felt very like golden not golden child scapegoaty for me is the way that one thing that's like very scapegoat like mm -hmm. is that we like to keep everything peaceful like yeah. we'll make a big deal about something if we think that it's like important like something like how percy got angry at dionysus in the last episode because Dionysus was just wanting to leave Annabeth to die mm -hmm. so when it's something like that we'll make we'll say things and we'll be the ones to bring stuff up when other people won't because we know it's important but otherwise we want to be the one to like keep everything peaceful even mm -hmm. if nobody else is like being that same way to us and so this scene like it was just interesting to see how he's like pointing out things that are that make sense like they're arguing about who gets to go in the quest Mm -hmm. he's like there should be three and two and they all like turn and look at him like they're surprised that he said something yeah is it like thalia won't even talk to him at this point still and so it's like and they're like surprised and he's like it should be three of one group and two of another to make it equal and mm -hmm. they all just like are almost like surprised that he's like just being smart and strategic and stuff about it all and and it's like, yeah, he's not the one that's going to be an overdramatic weirdo <laughs> about this stuff. He's just going to plan this. He doesn't want his best friend to die. And he's definitely not going to use this opportunity as a time to be ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah. it's also just like, that's the role we usually play is the one to kind of almost like in the last, um, during like the capture the flag fight, Chiron was like begging Percy to stop because he knew that Percy was the one that would be more likely to stop and that Thalia would not. Yeah. And that's usually how it goes is like so many times my mom would ask me to be the one to stop, to like walk away from my sister when she would be screaming at me or for me to like leave the house when she was like losing it on me. And I would just usually do it because it's one of those weird things that they know that the other person is too immature to actually do what they should. And so they know that you're not. And so they ask you instead. And it was just that sort of like energy of this scene of like, Percy's really depressed and nobody even realizes it because he hasn't yeah. said anything about it out loud. And, and like nobody has noticed enough about it because they're wrapped up in their own stuff that they don't even notice how sad he is about absolutely every aspect of his life in this point, like of what's happening. Um, yeah. And it's just that whole thing of even though all of that stuff is going on, he's still saying, like, this is the smartest way for you guys to be successful on your quest. And when they don't pick him, he's like surprised. He's like, wait a second. Like, I wanted to go, though. Like, can't I go? <laughs> um, it's my best friend and I'm having dreams about her. Shouldn't like he doesn't say the dream part, but still we know that he's doing that. Like, shouldn't he be the one? And he's like almost like surprised of like, wait, I wanted to go, though. <laughs> like why why aren't you picking me <laughs> um well we find out how big the stakes are in this meeting which i think is partly why he was distracted which is that um so zoe says artemis has to be present at the winter solstice and she has to be present because she has been the most vocal against like starting to position themselves against the titans and her being absent means that nothing's gonna get done and it's really funny because mr d is like are you saying we can't come to a decision without her? And so he's like, yeah, yeah, I am. And he's like, okay, just checking, you're right. <laughs> like, that's that's absolutely true, but thank you for, like, pointing that out. <laughs> yeah, and so, like, what I kind of got from that is just, like, I think Percy is probably split two ways, I mean, as as anyone would be in the situation of, like, Oh shoot, that's a really big stake with Kronos. Kronos and Luke have been doing this thing. I think Percy at this point probably realizes that Annabeth being missing is vaguely connected. Mm -hmm. And like, even if he doesn't realize how, 
he knows that that's probably part of whatever plan is happening right now. Um, especially when you consider that Artemis is the protector of young women and like, yeah, she's going to probably be, um, I mean, I'm, I'm basically giving a spoiler for something that happens later in the chapter, but like she can definitely be set up with the trap really easily with that because she would want to protect Annabeth. Annabeth mm -hmm. is literally the age group that she gravitates towards. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think Percy is just so distracted while they're going through this list and the hunters. So he decides right away, um, Talia, she wants to go. And then Grover just like stands up and is like, Hey, I want to go. I've been stalking you guys. I'm, but I'm also a satyr and I can do a seeker song and, you know, like I bring skills to the table. Um, which Zoe seems impressed with and is fine with. Um, but this is where we can get back into the Artemis stuff because I feel like it's a very clear prejudice against human boys that is happening here. Number one, satyrs are fertility spirits. You know, they're out there frolicking and doing their thing with the nymphs in, in the forests constantly. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't double check this and I said it on one of our voice notes together, but I'm pretty sure one of the fertility gods whose name is Priapis is literally a satyr with a giant phallus. So, um, like, and she, Zoe is basically like, I don't want Percy to go because he is a boy. I can't have a boy around my hunters, but Grover's okay because he's a satyr and, um, he doesn't really count as a boy. And, even though he's been stalking us and following us and is very much in love with us, I don't find him intimidating. So yeah, he's fine. Yeah, he's so wrapped up in trying to impress Artemis that he quite literally forgot that if he goes that Percy cannot. <laughs> and yeah. he was like, wait, I shouldn't go. What am I doing? <laughs> like yeah. Percy should actually go on this quest, but it was it's like a weird like allegory thing like I, I know I said it to you earlier like I don't know which one it would be like a disability one racism one sexism one all of them mixed together that they see mm -hmm. him as less like as less than because he's not a human in a way that even though they see him as lower than them it's like they don't see him as like dangerous or something in the same yeah. way even though he's the same as as like Percy most of the time he's still a boy mm -hmm. and it's just like a thing of like why d that whole thing was so frustrating to just be like this is why I hate when people fall so much on the men are always bad or like men are always the problem or men are always the you know, like they're never the victim or whatever um because of situations like this where um Thalia going on this quest is not a good idea yeah he hasn't actually proven anything to show that she should go besides the fact that she has a vagina that's the only reason that's the only thing she has going for her is that she is a girl like she is born female mm -hmm. that is the only thing about her that makes her good enough to them to go on a quest where if they don't if they don't succeed one of the gods, something bad might happen to them. And also Annabeth might be killed. Yeah. And like the stakes are that high and they're just picking people just based on their, like their sexual, like what their sex is from when they were born. Yeah. And especially when you think about it, like all the things just so far that has happened in this book, like so far Thalia wandered away at the dance where she didn't even notice when Bianca and Nico were being kidnapped mm -hmm. by the manticore. Like Percy is the one that noticed that. So she wasn't paying attention, didn't notice that. And when Percy tried to like agree with her that she, he doesn't like the hunters either, she cut, she like ripped his head off and blamed him for Annabeth being kidnapped and then yelled at the hunters, almost crashed the sun chariot because she won't admit that she's afraid of heights and almost hurt a bunch of people doing that instead of just asking for help. And then during capture of the flag came up with the most ridiculous plan and electrocuted Percy three times. Mm -hmm. Like what has she, she hasn't done anything to show that she deserves to go on a quest like this, but because, and she's 
Other than that, the only thing she has going for her is that one time she sacrificed herself and her dad turned her into a tree. Yeah. That's it. That's like that's her qualifications. The one time she was out for a couple of years, she sacrificed herself and didn't succeed and is only alive because Kronos wants to use her at some point to do something in this book. And so it's like she hasn't done anything, but because she's in that golden child role and she's a girl, she just gets the benefit of the doubt and she gets to go. Mm-hmm. And Percy, who like, it's, the, I guess the thing I always remembered in this book about this scene was how Zoe says to Percy that like, oh, you want to go just to like save Annabeth? And it's like, you only want to go to save Artemis. Yeah. What point are you making here? Like, well, she's yeah. making the point of like, who is Annabeth compared to a goddess, but it's not right. Yeah, and oh, someone's asking if we get to know why Thalia went away from the, in the gym, and no, we don't. We just know that, for whatever reason, her and Grover, when they were dancing, did something. Got distracted? Got distracted and, like, went too far away where they didn't notice what was happening. Um, So whatever happened there, who knows, but it was just them not really paying attention. Mm -hmm. Um, But either way, it's just... Oh my God. It's just a a ridiculous thing that they're like, it's the, this is the kind of stuff about like the different gender roles or, or whatever that I hate because it can never be this like simple that they think that something is like bad or like less than for Percy because he wants to go on this quest to save his best friend when they want to go for the literally the exact same reason. But yeah. it's but because it's them and it's the things that they care about, it's fine. But when it's Percy, because he's a boy, it like somehow means that he's like not as good as the demigod and is like too wrapped up in his like emotions and isn't taking things seriously. And like this is like a whole theme in this book because this is the book where at the end Athena tells him that his fatal flaw is that he cares about people too much. And I'm like, I will like literally probably throw my book across the room when we have that scene because that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life to tell somebody that the thing that is wrong with you is that you like people and you protect them and you don't want them to die. Please. Oh my gosh, yeah. Like not his fatal flaw at all. His fatal flaw is that he thinks that he needs to sacrifice himself if things are going wrong. And that's just like what he should do. That's not the same thing at all. It's actually a really good thing <laughs> that he cares yeah. about people and isn't willing to just like act like a stoic her- heroic idiot and have people die in his name and then move on as if nothing ever happens like no that's that's horrible but anyway it's just that whole idea that because it's him somehow him caring about Annabeth makes him less than or mm-hmm. makes him like a like a liability and it's like <sighs> Wouldn't you want somebody that's really powerful on your quest that cares a lot about it, like succeeding? Yeah. And also, wouldn't you want someone on your quest who's having dreams about what's going on? Yes. But they don't even know that because they haven't actually talked to him because he's a boy. Mm-hmm. And so they haven't even bothered to like ask him like, hey, you're Annabeth's best friend, right? You came here with her. Have you had any dreams about her? And it's like, oh yeah, I have. That like conversation doesn't even happen because they just assume because he's a boy, he's like, there's something less about him. And it's completely ridiculous. (laughs) Yeah. And so so he shows like his first outright, like there is something wrong with me and not going to dinner that night. And Grover and Chiron immediately come by to check on him. That's like when someone finally is like, oh my, oh my gosh, there's something up with him. We should check to see. <laughs> oh, Percy doesn't want to eat. Percy's depressed. And I was like, yeah, thank you that everybody finally figure that out. <laughs> yeah. But he's like not happy. It took a while, but at least somebody finally realized it when he did the depression thing of skipping meals like we all do at some point. <laughs> Yeah, and I definitely noted that um, Percy immediately goes to, I need to make Grover feel better because Grover feels bad about the fact that he volunteered and it ended up being him instead Mm -hmm. of me. Mm -hmm. And especially like there's some line in there where he, where Percy is saying where he feels like there is like an empty, like 
like hole in his chest because of how sad and like depressed he is by everything that's going on. But on the outside, he's just like trying to take care of everybody else, which yeah. is aggressively a scapegoat experience. <laughs> that's what that's what we do. We try to make sure that people don't notice when we're upset um, and just try to take care of everybody else and hope and like try to be almost like useful or something to other people. We just don't think about ourselves like that. Well, and he goes into kind of shutdown mode during the meeting. Um, yeah, immediately when Chiron backs up the hunters and is like, you know what, this isn't a hunt for Artemis. So yeah, they make the final call. And yeah, like, like Chiron is like basically like mumbling about how I guess the hunters need to like approve of whoever's on the quest or something. Um, it's at least nice to know that Chiron, you know, doesn't like it it's obvious yeah that he doesn't like what's happening but it's also a thing of picking his battles <laughs> yeah so and i'm going to um, talk about chiron in a little bit later because i really like him um honestly and and i just think he's it's interesting to see him try to play this the role that he does but um yeah it's just a thing of uh at the last episode we talked we were talking about the differences between scapegoats and golden childs and stuff Okay. And one of the things that we talked about was how scapegoats have like more hope about okay. things and that golden children are more generally like pessimistic people. Yeah. And so one thing that does happen when you have when you're the scapegoated role is that sometimes you try to get your hopes up about something working out and when it doesn't work, you just kind of I don't know how to describe it, but you just have this moment where you just realize that it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes other people try to like, you know, they'll try to like, you know, raise like your hopes and stuff and be like, oh, maybe it'll work out or maybe this will happen or maybe that will happen. And you're just like, no, I know that it's not going to happen. I know that this is just what's going to happen. And you just kind of accept it in this horrible way. But it feels like really horrible when you do because you want to you get like these moments where you get like you want to believe that like people will be better. You don't want to believe that people just do like what you think they'll do. You want them to like realize what's going on and like change their mind. Mm. And so it feels worse every time to like get your hopes up and then realize that it's gone, which is pretty much what he does, where he just like shuts down yeah. during the and starts like dissociating basically because he's not even listening to what they're saying when the when the meeting is ending and just like goes to be depressed in his cabin and <laughs> after that by himself and doesn't want to talk to anybody. But that's basically what that is, because those moments really suck. They really, really suck. And it takes a while after they happen for you to get like to be able to hope for something like that again. Um, it's like our whole cycle that we do. We are constantly kind of doing that and trying to like not make ourselves too depressed, basically, by doing that too often if it doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. um, but that's very much what he's doing there, where he's just like, I wanted to think that I would be able to go and help my best friend who is being tortured right now when they were planning on taking me this whole time. And to realize that the hunters just took it over and didn't let him come and that there was nothing that he could do about it. It's like, okay, then I guess I'm just going to sit here and be depressed now. Yeah. Who just expects me to like, not do anything <laughs> yeah he also says i don't know that i would have picked you either because you also act without thinking it's just you're not sure of yourself and so i don't know what to make of that because it could be good or it could be bad <laughs> that's just like a good way to sum up the golden child scapegoat roles mm -hmm. is because that's what it really is is that we're not sure of ourselves ever yeah. And so yeah, even though we want to be impulsive sometimes because we just get tired of waiting for something to get better, um, we also are like, like, constantly perennially scared that something's going to go wrong, or yeah. that we're wrong. Like every single, like TikTok video I ever post where someone starts arguing with me in the comments. I always end up Googling it to make sure that I'm actually right about whatever I'm talking about, even though I'm sure that I am, because I'm just like, what if I am wrong? And, and if I am wrong, I just like delete the video, but that like, har that hardly ever happens. But I just like assume, like, maybe I, I am the one that's wrong. And this person is actually right. And then I'll check and it'll be like, Oh, no, 
like I am right about this. What are they talking about? Um, but that is kind of like what we do is that's like why we tend to be not as like destructive mm -hmm. and, and don't throw the like epic golden child temper tantrums that are like some of the most dangerous shit ever. Like how, like what, um, Salia did in the last chapters of electrocuting him a bunch of times. That was a really great temper tantrum she did there. And like Percy would never imagine, like would even like think about doing something like that to somebody. Yeah. Um, the only time I can think of him fighting that much with like another demigod is when he's possessed. Mm -hmm. In like one of the much later, one of the Heroes of Olympus books, he gets possessed by something that makes him fight another kid but even when he's possessed he's like you can tell that he's like trying to fight against it um mm -hmm. that's just not how he is um one i think chiron's really interesting because people sometimes will uh dm me and ask me percy jackson questions and if you ever want to do that please do that because i <laughs> love talking to people about it um but i've had a couple pe different people be like oh what do you think about chiron and because some people think that he is like um like part of like the problem with the gods and stuff and mm -hmm. some people want to like him and things like that and they're like so what do you think about him and i'm like i chiron has this really interesting role to me where whenever there's like an abusive system of any sort there's somebody in it who has to the kind of like play the role where they actually see like the consequences of the decisions that the abusive people are making and they have to sit there and like watch it happen and then try to find a way to deal with it and like it's easy to be like an abusive little asshole where you say these things or hurt people around you but and you never have to actually deal with like the emotional fallout of it all mm -hmm. And so Chiron is like this person that is the one that has to deal with all of the things that the gods do to their children. Yeah. Like he has to see how scared they all are. He has to watch all of the kids in the Hermes cabin never get claimed for years on end and how upsetting that is for them. He has to watch how scared they all get when somebody goes on a quest. He has to deal with what happens when somebody doesn't come back because they die on their quest or something happens to them or whatever, or one of the kids that they're trying to get back doesn't make it to camp or something like that. Like he's the one that has to deal with all of that mm -hmm. for thousands of years. That's just his role where he's constantly is trying to take care of these kids as best he can. He can only do so much because if he does too much, the gods will also do something to him. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's e so easy for the gods to just be like, oh, we're too busy to claim our kids, but he is the one that actually has to take care of these kids and try to help them and he has to see how hard all of this is all the time and so i think that he really cares and he tries as much as he can within like the system he's in to take care of these kids as best as he possibly can yeah. because i do think that he generally cares about them like and i think that he generally loves percy and really cares about him and like wants to help him wants to protect him in ways that he can or just help him out in whatever ways is possible with everything that he's up against. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he's like this. Some people think that he, he might be like more on the manipulation side and I, but I don't think that he is. I think he actually does care and really does try um, to point stuff out. And like when I was, <laughs> When I read this scene again, I was like, I feel like he told Percy to call his mom because he wanted Percy to leave. Yeah. I think that he wanted Percy to leave to join the quest and it was just like, obviously couldn't say that out loud because he would get in trouble. Mm -hmm. if, if he did that, the gods would find out and they would get angry. And so I think instead he said this stuff to Percy of like, you know, both of you are really impetuous and impulsive, but you're better at handling this stuff as like almost like a thing of like, when you go on this quest, you're going to have to be around Thalia yeah. and like try to keep this in mind to like keep everything together um, and everything because I just think that that's what he was doing because I can't see Chiron just being like, yeah, you're just going to like hang out at your mom's house over <laughs> over Christmas when you know that Annabeth is 
dying and having dreams every day about her dying yeah i don't think that he ever even thought that percy would do something like that and i don't think that he wanted him to i think think the other side the other side is he didn't know how it would happen because like literally they lined up the amount of people that the prophecy said so like he wants it to still happen just as much as we'll get to the call with sally coming up like they know percy well enough to know he can't just sit back while this is happening to annabeth and i and like kyra knows sally enough too to know that she's a good mom and is somebody that would like tell him to do what is right instead of to do what he's like supposed to Mm -hmm. um Oh, one thing from the meeting that we didn't talk about that I wanted to say to about the hunters and stuff is it like bothered me a lot that Zoe chose to bring Bianca um, mm-hmm. because she's a 12 year old like child who found out two days ago in the, in the in like this story mm-hmm. that she even is a demigod. And so it feels like to me that feels like a grooming thing almost of like bringing the new person along to like test them to see and like almost like throwing them into a dangerous situation to see if they can handle it basically sort of yeah. thing um and also a thing of like look how cool I'll look like when we're <laughs> when we're on this quest together and things like that and how how fun all of this stuff is because they're that's obviously a big part of their recruitment stuff that they do to get people to join the hunters is to be like look how cool and fun all of this all of the things that we do are Um, But I'm like, you're bringing a 12 year old kid who doesn't know anything on this very dangerous quest because you want to like convince her basically that you've that she's made the right choice or something. I don't know. But either way, it just is like not a good idea. And it's it almost feels more like Zoe wanting to. (sighs) I'm trying not to like say spoilers about Zoe because there's a line in the prophecy that the oracle said in the last chapter that as soon as zoe heard it she knew what it meant Mm -hmm. and like knew that it was about her and everything and um like you don't know when you're reading this book for the first time like that stuff until you get much farther along but that is a part of this book and so it feels like weird considering that situation that she decided to bring one of the, like the newest recruit along with her on this trip when she knew what was what was probably going to happen at some point and it's like why did why would you want to why would you want to do that to her like i'm trying to be like super vague about it but it's like why would you want to bring that bring her with on this sort of a trip anyway and um considering what happens to Bianca in this book it's I think it's like a good thing to bring up of like this was a really bad idea like so many things go so wrong because of what happens with that um and it was a horrible decision that she made to bring a a kid that doesn't know what she's doing yeah um on this sort of a thing that is so important like if it's so important that you're yelling at Chiron to let like let you out of camp early in the middle of the night then like why wouldn't you bring one of the many other hunters you have with you that knows what they're doing instead of a kid that doesn't know what's happening yeah yeah like, something else that i didn't bring up during uh, one of my notes this is the only thing that i will ever canonize from the movies so in sea of monsters I still laugh thinking about it. The scene where Luke bows down, he's like, I'm your great grandson, Kratos. <laughs> and he's like, my favorite. And he grabs him. Yeah. Um, let's see. So when they're talking through the prophecy lines, the one shall perish by a parent's hand. Um, and so Chiron was like, I would have gone myself, but that line kind of scared me. And he's like, you know, I, I know my dad doesn't really care for his kids. I play in my book, except to eat. <laughs> <laughs> That's all Chiron wants. Yeah. Um, except in this version that isn't on like 17 different drugs, like the Sea of Monsters movie is, he does he never takes like form because that's his whole thing is that he doesn't have a body. Mm-hmm. That's like the number one thing about his myth is that he doesn't have a body and they were just like, we're just going to make him look like the devil anyway. Yeah. Because Why like, not? apparently Rick Riordan wasn't angry enough at them when, in his, in all of his um, emails for the first movie. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. Um, so yeah. we get to um, Chiron tells Percy, call your mom, tell her you're coming home. And yeah, like you said, it seems to be him, you know, like hint, hint, you know, you should probably let her know you're okay because you don't know what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to cry reading this Sally Jackson <laughs> part because first Percy spies and he sees like she's doing great. She has a guy home. She's laughing. She's studying. And so when he finally gets to talk to her because the guy gets up and goes to the bathroom, she basically when he's like, I'm going to come home, you know, all of this is happening with Annabeth and the quest and I wasn't picked to go on. So I just have to go home. She says, Percy just do what you need to do like don't worry about coming home just do whatever you think is right because i trust you and i trust your heart and as a mom of a preteen like <laughs> you know what things are going to get your kids riled up like you know what things are going to get them i don't want to say excited isn't the right word for it but the the things that are really going to get their wheels turning and make them want to jump into action Mm -hmm. I did one by accident. I'm, I'll try to be vague about it because I don't want to talk about the personal situation too much, but I had like a friendship breakup recently mm -hmm. and it was with somebody who is connected to William through like children. And so I, for the longest time was like, I'm not going to say anything about what happened unless he directly asks. But then as the kids started going to school again and like are put together a little bit more, it was necessary to tell him. And once I was like, yeah, we're just taking a break from each other right now, which is the line that my therapist fed me, I was not prepared for this child to keep asking me questions. And so I panicked and I was like, we had a miscommunication, but you know what, the way that the, <laughs> the, way the miscommunication was handled makes me like hesitant to, you know, like dive back in. Mm -hmm. And um, so, randomly like a few days later he comes out of school saying i think i can clear up the miscommunication like let me try i think i can do it mm -hmm. and i was like buddy no no like also no. like that's not your responsibility exactly and you know <laughs> when he the whole grown-up yeah. stuff like you don't have to worry about this it doesn't affect you we'll still make sure you can hang out with your friend mm -hmm. but like the fact that he wanted to take that on, I was just like, Shit, I, I fucked up. I fucked up so bad uh, by like not, you know, like doing that. I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to answer. I, I couldn't stay strong when he was just like, no, what happened? What What's going on? You need to tell me. Um, and so like, you know, there's things I know there's recently another school like Pew Pew situation. I've said this before. I see my kid being the one trying to like take somebody down or defend or storming them. And that is really scary. But you know your kids when you're a mom and she knows that like, yeah, I could tell him you have to come home because Chiron said, you know, it's the safest thing for you, which Percy is expecting. He literally says, I'm expecting her to be another adult, you know, just telling me doing nothing is the best answer when that's not true. And mm -hmm. she doesn't do it because she knows even if I were to tell him, do nothing, come home, we'll have Christmas together, he would still go out anyway. <laughs> and well, I think it's also a thing of Sally, Sally knows what is best for her child, mm -hmm. even if what's best for him is not what's best for her. Exactly. He chooses to be like, no, I want you to be happy. And even though you're not happy right now, I know that you sitting at home with me would be absolutely horrible for you. Mm -hmm. I want you to go out there and try to help your friend instead. And like, when I read that, I was like, wow, like, it must be really nice to grow up with a mom during those ages that puts like your wants over their own. Mm -hmm. It's just, that would have been really nice. <laughs> yeah and i was just like wow that's really nice of her to do to be like a good mom that's why i think that chiron did that on purpose is because i think he knows sally enough now to know that she would do that for percy and like give him permission to leave and mm -hmm. to not stay not do like what everyone is telling him to because it's not the right thing and it's true like 
especially because Chiron knows that what's happening is not right, that Thalia shouldn't be on the quest, he should be doing it. And the only reason it happened that way is because the hunters are ridiculous. And so if this is the only way that they can kind of fix that. And so that's what, and that's what they're going to do. Um, I did want to mention the guy that, that Sally is with is Paul. Yes. Is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I love Paul so much and everyone does because it's the only father figure that Percy has in his life that is like such a good dad like is always an actual dad like is always there for him and like fights monsters when he can't even see them at a certain point he has no idea what he's even doing but he just does it anyway um to help Percy like he he like accepts that this whole world exists when he doesn't have to know about it and just goes with it yeah and helps him so much and is just kind of there as that sort of person and like is I like the little scene they had where he sees him and he's like, you know, freaked out by another guy being by his mom because mm -hmm. the only guy around his mom was Gabe. Yeah. And so that automatically is going to make him feel weird and strange. And it is a one of one of those other like theme things of this of this book that things are like changing in his life in a way that he can't really control. And it is part of it that his mom is now he doesn't fully understand it at this point but she's you know kind of lying to him <laughs> when she says like oh he's just a friend from school like they're definitely like something by this point and she just doesn't want to tell him yet <laughs> um but it is a thing that like even his home life is like starting to change a little bit differently where his mom is starting to be around other guys and he has to like get used to that again and it's just little stuff like that and Sally's just like the best mom anyway. And whenever mm -hmm. I read her being a, a good mom, I'm like, damn, like, I don't have children. I'm never going to have children, but it would be really nice to be able to teach, like, treat a kid like that. Yeah, I have someone in my comments asking, what do you think of the gods reasoning for why they can't be in their children's lives? It's bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> um, basically, how, how I see the gods in Percy Jackson is they're all just abusive parents. Okay. And like we talked about this before with Hermes, where in Sea of Monsters at the end of the book, Hermes is trying to be like, oh, your parents are just out there doing things for you and they don't and you just don't know what they're doing. And like his version of that is that he's out there um, being a little like, you know, enabler for Luke. And in his mind, he's like, I'm staying away from my son and neglecting him every day of his life because it's too hard for me to be near him because I know he's going to die one day and it's like that makes you a weak bitch exactly like, that doesn't make you a good that actually makes you a really bad parent and also just weak in general like you die one day and it's like that makes you a weak bitch i'm staying away from my son and neglecting him every day of his life because it's too hard for me to be near him because i know he's gonna die one day and it's like that makes you a weak bitch exactly like, that doesn't make you a good that actually makes you a really bad parent and also just weak in general like you can't like that's crazy that's like if i was not around my niece because one day she's like gonna go to college and i won't see her as much anymore like why the hell would i do that <laughs> or it's just like why would i do that just because they're gonna leave one day that like, that's true for everybody that doesn't mean that they they're the gods basically put their put like their needs first yeah like they, they know somewhere in their minds that what they're doing is hurting their kids they just don't care and mm -hmm. it's e it, it's easy like i was saying about you know the role that chiron has where he's the one that has to like actually see the effects of their decisions on these kids it's that sort of a thing that if you're never there and you never see the kids and never see like how hard it is for them to not have like a cabin at camp and things like that it's just easy to keep making horrible decisions that traumatize these children if you never ha actually have to know them so that you know what you're doing to these kids and so it's it's literally them being like if i never speak to my kid i can just act like it's not happening yeah and that's not fair in like seventeen thousand different ways <laughs> that's not at all what i i know i've said this before as an example but like with my niece that's a year and a half old it would be honestly like it would be easier for me as a 
as like the years go on if I wasn't in her life that much because there's a lot of like family stuff and trauma stuff that's going to make that really difficult for me personally okay. not just it just is like even being around kids like her age it just reminds me of how young I was when things was happening to me and it just I like when I'm whenever I'm around her or other kids that are a little bit older I just realize how young I actually was when all these crazy things were happening in my life and it just I like I don't like being around them for longer than a few hours at a time because that stuff just like makes me sad after a while and but it would be easier for me if I just didn't see her that much because I wouldn't have to think about that every time I see her but I'm not gonna do that mm -hmm. like I love her and I want to see her as much as possible even if that stuff is hard for me that doesn't matter like I would want to see her and I don't want to be absent from her life just because it's something that I need to deal with that's not fair to her like I want her to know me and like why would I take myself out of somebody's life who loves me just because I have emotions about it that makes it something I need to handle like that's why I go to therapy every week I'm yeah. not going to just like cut out a huge part of my life and but that's basically what they're doing is they just cut off like huge parts of their life and then they get like surprised when their kids are mad at them yeah, <laughs> yeah. well in Thetis Achilles mom is kind of an example of someone who knows like my kid is going to live a really short life I am not going to get to watch them grow old, let alone live out eternity with them. And Thetis still, like, she helps Achilles in every way possible while he is on this earth, mm -hmm. um, which a lot of people call her a boy mom. I tend to think, like, what would you do if you had a kid that, like, you knew had some sort of disease or something where you're going to outlive them? Like you would make sure that kid had the most awesome fucking life ever. Mm -hmm. And um, cause like, that's all you can do. Mm -hmm. um, so the person also asked in connection to the fates, um, I, the gods can't really affect fate. Like can in Greek mythology, canonically, the only one that can is Zeus. Um, so it doesn't really make sense that all of them are like staying out of it maybe maybe it's hard to not tell your kids everything you know because they do have some sort of omniscience they do kind of all know things that are going to happen eventually but yeah. um like honestly when yeah. it comes to like our own lives like that happens with like your son and like my niece even though their ages are much differently yeah. like we know that things are going to happen with them when they get older that are going to be difficult for them to deal with like mm -hmm. we know that those things are going to be happening because we've lived through years of our life where we remember what it was like during those ages when those things happened and yeah. especially like knowing our families we know that certain like things may come up in some way as the years go on but it's also a thing of like just because that's going to happen doesn't mean that you just stop existing or you just like take yourself completely out of the thing it's like even if you know something the best way I know how to explain that with my own family is that the last couple of years I've gotten relationships back with some of my like extended families like aunts and uncles and stuff that I haven't really had a relationship with for most of my life yeah. and all of them are old like all of them are in like their late 60s or like early to like mid 70s at this point and yeah like I know I've said this to you before where I'm like damn when my aunt Sarah dies, I'm going to be really fucking depressed because we have a really great relationship now. It's a lot like we had a good relationship growing up, actually, with that one. But still, it's a lot more significant now. Mm -hmm. Like I told her that I consider her like my replacement mom or like yeah. backup mom, basically, which is the role she has in my life still. And so like I I'm, I know I've said that to you before, like, wow, it's almost kind of an amazing thing for me to be sad again about people dying because so many people in my family I don't like and so I didn't care that much when they died to be honest and so it feels almost like a special thing that that when she dies I'm gonna like grieve her a lot and it's gonna be really hard but at the same time I'm not gonna not see her yeah. and have a relationship with her just because I know that one day at some point she's gonna die like I, I know just I even though I know that's gonna hurt a lot that doesn't mean that I'm just gonna not do it 
I'm going to do it. And it's like the pain of losing them is worth it because you have them in your life. Yeah. And that's like the whole thing is the gods could have their kids in their lives. They just choose not to because it's just easier for them. Mm -hmm. And that's not fair, obviously. Yeah, it seems to be one of those, this is just the way it's always been done, so we'll keep doing it this way kind of things. And that's a really unhealthy outlook. Yeah, there there is some point in one of the later books, I don't remember which one it is, where um, Percy's talking to Hermes, and Hermes is like, the gods have been this way for like 4,000 years. Do you really think that we could change? And he's like, yep, I do. Yep. And just kind of looks at him like that. <laughs> and like Hermes is like trying to say there's no way that we could ever change. And they do change. Like that's the whole point of this these books is that Percy makes them change. But it shows that they are capable of change because he he they do it. <laughs> like they yeah. do what he what he asks them to when he has the power to get them to do what he wants. But it's always possible for them to change. They just tell themselves that it's not. That's always the thing. <laughs> Yeah, um, let's keep moving, though, because I don't want to run too far into William's bedtime. So Mm -hmm. the next scene in the book is Percy having a dream. And Percy is basically seeing Annabeth holding up. He can't tell what it is yet, but a pile of boulders. And they bring Artemis to her. Basically, it's a trap. He sees the whole trap happen where... Artemis goes and is like, let me lift this burden from your shoulders because you look like you're about to die, little girl. And um, she is that now stuck holding the burden. Luke convinces Kronos like, oh, we could still use this girl. And um, was it Kronos that he was talking to directly? I think it was. No, No. general. He's talking to the general. Mm -hmm. Um, So he's like, we can still use her. She's still useful, which like it gives you a moment of pause of like, Okay, but does he care about her a little bit? Like, even though he just did all of that to her? Um, Because, I mean, he really could easily just be like, okay, we're done with her, bye. Um, (laughs) But he doesn't. And, I mean, maybe it is strategic. Maybe he really is thinking Percy's going to come after her no matter what, so I should keep her. But the general tells him no matter what, after Solstice, it's over because there's no way she could be useful after that. But go ahead. And it's also a thing I think of like just how abusive people like Luke are is that everything they do is kind of in service of themselves. Mm -hmm. So to him, I feel like he would want to keep Annabeth alive. Like Thalia said that during the, during like their meeting earlier, like, oh, Luke would want her to be alive still. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he would want her to be alive in the hopes that he can get her on her, his side. Yeah because she would be like a very big asset for him to have. And so I think that he wants her to be alive. And you, I guess you could look at it as like, oh, he still cares about her. But it's like, no, I think it's more that he wants her to be alive because he thinks he can eventually convince her to join him Mm -hmm. and would rather go through that whole thing, um, which does work with a scene that happens between them in the fourth book. And so it does make sense that he would think that. Um, But yeah, I think that's where that is more coming from. And speaking of Luke, one thing that we forgot to say is that the fact that Selena is his mole Mm -hmm. in this book. And I almost like wonder if part of why she said she couldn't go on the quest was because she was supposed to be at camp to be like his person. And if he showed up to ask what to talk to her and she wasn't there that she might get in like big trouble, but it's also a thing that like Selena is the head of her cabin. And so she knows about everything that they Mm -hmm. ever do ever. And she's the one that's like been groomed by him to give him information about what's going on at camp. Like he picked somebody that was in a position of importance. Yeah. Like nothing then that happens at camp that he doesn't know about. Exactly. Um, Let's see. Uh... Another thing that I kind of wrote out in here, so they just keep alluding to really ancient monsters. It's all like stuff that comes up. Like if you were to be reading Greek mythology and you're reading Hesiod, um, which is kind of the one that talks about from the beginning of creation to at least like Zeus getting into position of power. Um, So 
the Drachini. I think I'm saying that right because the A E is pronounced mm -hmm. supposed to be pronounced like an I. So um, the general says the Drachini can guard her. Um, an example of a Drachini, which is like a woman with serpentine legs, is Echidna. So um, mm -hmm. it's calling back to some of these titans we've already seen. Um, and yeah, um, there's also like they're saying, you know, all of this is assuming that Anna Breath doesn't just die. Yeah, and she almost did just die. Mm -hmm. um, like she was about to die yeah. um, before they did that with her. And it's also, it just, like you said before about Artemis, it shows how easy it is for people to manipulate her. Mm -hmm. That they took her. One thing with this book that I think is interesting and fun to think about is like their plan was originally for them to take Percy. And so like I said last time, like they wouldn't have used Luke as a way to like, to like try to act sympathetic because that wouldn't have worked with Percy. They probably would have like somehow used manipulation some other way to get him to do it for a week. Yeah. But the original plan was to use him as the one like holding up the sky and have him die at the end of it because they just because that's what they were going to do. And so I almost like wonder who they would have used as like for like a god to trap like would that would Poseidon have been there? Yeah, it was Percy because it wouldn't have it definitely wouldn't have been Artemis if it was him. And yeah, so, um, so it's like, like asking Luke is older than Selena. Um, he would be what 21 in this one? Yeah, he's 21 and she's 14. Yeah, so he is much older. He's one of the oldest demigods that was in camp at the same time as Percy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because most of them don't make it. <laughs> yeah, and he says in like the, the book that came out after all these books were over, where there was chapters from like his perspective, he said that he chose her because he knew that she had a crush on him. So yeah. she was more likely to do what he said because she already wanted to do what he wanted anyway. <sighs> Gross, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then um, Percy gets woken up from his dream by Blackjack, a Pegasus that um, just apparently he's been doing all of these weird underwater uh, missions where because anytime he's around a body of water, they're just like, hey, Lord, can you help us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he gets taken off and then that's where we start chapter eight, which um, so it turns out i'm gonna when blackjack takes him out to a spot in the ocean and is like go straight down you know like there's something happening down there and percy sees hippocampi encircling this turned over boat that's on top of some sort of creature thrashing in a net and they are just going around in circles like they're panicking until they see him and they're like help us help us please help us um Let's see. So uh, it turns out that the thing under the boat it is a cow with the back end of a serpent. I am probably going to mess up this pronunciation, but it's an Ophiotaurus. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is like, I know all the people that get on us about mythology are like, oh, Ovid's too late and Ovid does his own things. Um, Ovid wrote during the first titan war there was an omen that whoever sacrificed this um Ophiotaurus, we're just gonna call them bessies because that's a lot less of a mouthful um whoever sacrifices it and gives an offering of its entrails would win the titan war and the titans they have the bessie they are about to sacrifice it like they cut it open entrails are opened and Zeus sends a kite, as in like a bird kite, mm -hmm. to go fetch the entrails and he makes the offering first. So the fact that this ancient being is around again, kind of is a callback to that original Titan War and is kind of, I almost wonder what they're doing here with having Percy be the one to discover it and to set it free without using the blade which is a big thing because, I mean, sacrificing, cut out, cutting out the entrails, that thing probably knows. Um, it's more of a Roman thing. I don't know that the Greeks were this superstitious, but the Romans were so superstitious about their animal sacrifices. They thought that like the animals had to go in willingly. 
So it, and they were so OCD about it. Like if the animal stumbled, if it seemed not willing, they would do it again with a different animal or something, you know? So there is kind of an assumption in my head, at least, that this cow knows its fate. And that's why it freaks out when it sees Riptide. And so Percy freeing it and making a friend of it is, is very interesting considering that history. I think, first off, I love that Percy names it Bessie, yeah. which is a really good cow name. I yes. live in Wisconsin. I know good cow names. Um, we have many of them here. But um, I think it is, like, hilarious that the Artemis left because she said she needed to go find, like, an ancient beast that was out there. She wanted to go find Bessie. Mm -hmm. and Percy found it. Mm -hmm. and he wasn't even trying to find it. He just ended up finding it because it ended up getting stuck in water and people trust him. And so they came to him for help. And so the hunters during this book are looking for it and they can't find it. Percy found it and they didn't find it. And if they would have been nice to Percy and talked to him, he would have told him that they found it. He would have told them what he found, but because they're so horrible to him, he never tells them that sort of stuff, I'm pretty sure, in this book. And, it, like, at some point, he realizes that the thing that he freed is the thing that they're looking for. But, like, it's just absolutely hilarious to me that all of these hunters are so self-assured that they're right and they're smarter and better than he is. And he found what they're looking for for this entire fucking book on accident. Yep. <laughs> And it's just like, uh, thank you, like, Rick Riordan for doing that. And because... literally no one else could have done it. No. And it's th this is the stuff that I bring up when it comes to, like, Artemis and the Hunters, where I think that things are in this story where Rick wants you to, like, not like them that much, or at least question their, like, extreme self-assuredness with, like, gender politics. Because, mm -hmm. like, they are being so horrible to him that they end up, like having a much longer time trying to find this thing because they just don't talk to him. And it's just so funny that the boy is the one that finds it because just on accident that if they could have just saved themselves so much time, if they would have just talked to him and yeah. not treated him like he was less than be just because he's not a girl. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny that how, when I read that, I was like, that is absolutely fucking hilarious that Artemis couldn't find this thing and Percy found it on accident without even trying. <laughs> so another thing, this is a Rick Riordan thing, but I laughed at it. So I only know this because my, my kid's special interest is video games. And also mm -hmm. I was very into Nintendo, like since the childhood too. So um, one thing that he says while Percy is untangling the net, because Percy decides since this cow is freaking out at the sword, he's just going to gently untangle it bit by bit. And he says it's like un untangling video game controllers. The Nintendo Wii came out in 2006. This book came out in 2009. Wireless controllers were already a thing. Rick aged himself with that little line. Yeah, and I knew exactly what he meant when he said that. I had like vivid flashbacks to my childhood. Yes. Um, when he said that. And so that's the, something that like kids now would read that and they wouldn't know what that meant. Exactly. Um, I think that's funny. <laughs> yeah. So after Percy saves the sea cow, he goes back up to the surface and he finds Nico watching. He goes back up to the surface and he finds Nico and he's about to say something to Nico before he realizes, realizes oh, he's watching the hunters. Maybe I should be quiet and watch too. And he realizes he has the invisibility cap, which is the only thing he grabbed. So he puts it on and he can listen as well. And what turns out happened is that um, Phoebe, which is the other hunter that was supposed to go on the trip, got tricked in a way that has been used in Greek mythology before. I have told this story on my channel. It's the way Hercules died, um, kind of, kind of partially. Um, but the Stoll brothers, they said, oh yeah, that was the girl who bashed us on the head. Let's give her a t-shirt. The t-shirt was laced with centaur blood and centaur <laughs> blood is acidic. So she has hives and a rash and she's not going to be able to go now. Mm -hmm. 
you were shocked that Athena allowed him to wear the cap. I'm not sure that the gods have control of their magical objects once they're out in the world as much. Like they can give it to a certain person, but if that person loses it, they can lose it to just about anybody. So I don't think she has any control, even if it would piss her off a bit. Yeah, and, and when it comes down to it, that's Annabeth now. Yeah. And she would never had a problem with Percy wearing it. Exactly, yeah. So um, we find out Phoebe has been taken out, which means there's only two hunters going on this quest, along with two campers. And that means they are short a person. Now, as Nico and Percy are listening to this, they're both thinking the same thing. They are both sitting there being like, well, can I go? Because um, I want to protect my person, Nico thinking his sister, Percy thinking Annabeth. And um, eventually, Zoe and Bianca go back into their cab or back away because the big house lights are already lit. And Percy reveals himself to Nico. Um, who's just amazed that he's there and visible in the first place. And then um, Percy is able to very quickly convince him, like, you're, you can't go with him. You're too small. You're very little. Stay here. And um, Nico says, like, okay, I won't say anything. I won't tell on you if you promise that you will keep my sister safe. And Percy hesitates. He's like, I don't know if I could do that. There's a bunch of other people coming. So hopefully among us, we can all keep her safe. And that's not good enough for Nico. He still pushes him. And Percy says, I will do my best. Like, that's what he leaves it at. You can tell Nico is taking that as, yes, I will protect your sister. But he doesn't exactly say that. No. He doesn't actually promise to keep her alive because he can't yeah there's no way that he could do that but little nico is gonna look at it like that because he's 10. um mm -hmm. one thing i i thought of before that i didn't say was that i wonder if they took bianca on the quest because they didn't want her to stay at camp and be able to talk to nico again yeah. with the rest of the hunt where a bunch of the hunters were gone or at least zoe was gone to because they wouldn't want her to like keep close ties with the person that she just abandoned and so i like kind of wondered if maybe that was part of why zoe picked her to come anyway so that they wouldn't have a chance to talk because he's sitting there watching them obviously because he wants to talk to his freaking sister mm -hmm. um of course he does i hate this scene so much <laughs> like yeah it's heartbreaking because like if you know what happens and i also have someone in my comments saying like it's hap I'm so happy he says that, although he does blame himself later, and Nico has my heart. Nico has all of our heart. Um, and, like, it's so easy to see both sides of this. It's so easy to see that Nico was a 10-year-old child who was very hopeful that his sister could somehow make it with the help of this cool kid who saved his ass from a manticore and was just invisible in front of his face. Um, and for Percy... He really did try to not promise that. He tried his best to not promise that and just said what he needed to said, say to be able to go. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I do think that Percy did want to protect Bianca, but he knew, like, that isn't my journey here. It's also, it reminds me of, like, scapegoat stuff where sometimes we get, like, in these positions where we end up having to do things that we shouldn't have to do and similar to like what happened with Thalia before like people kind of use us as somebody to be mad at when they want to be upset about something that's gone wrong even though we know that it's not our fault we mm -hmm. tend to just like let people take that stuff out on us because we feel like it's probably our fault somehow anyway yeah um and so it's just one of those things of Percy should never be in this position anyway where this 10 year old kid is being like, can you please make sure that my sister doesn't die on this quest? That's why it's like, why did Zoe bring her? She never should have even brought her in the first place. And Zoe is the one who should be making this sort of promise to Nico, but she won't talk to him because she's a, he's a boy. Okay. And so Percy is somehow left being the one to hold the responsibility for the hunters because they won't do it because they're ridiculous. <laughs> And so none of this should be happening to him, but he's the one that's put in this position where he has to do it anyway, and then deal with the horrible fallout that happens later. 
Yeah, one thing that I highlighted during this whole interaction between Nico and Percy, and I don't know if this is a Hades kid thing as well, because I'm trying to make all of the Hades, kid, Hades kids <laughs> observations I can in this book. Um, it was when Nico says, you're planning to go anyway, aren't you? Percy in his brain says, I wanted to say no, but he looked me in the eyes and I somehow couldn't lie to him. Now, is that just because he can't and it's a conscious thing, or is it a Hades kid thing? I don't know, actually. Um, it might be a Hades kid thing, but it also just might be because Percy doesn't want to lie to, like, a 12-year-old little kid okay. that is, like, looking up to him in some way. And it's, like, at least looking to him as, like, a mentor person to help figure out how to handle this world. Mm -hmm. um, it could be some of his powers. I honestly don't remember, but... Even if it's not, it's like a thing of I don't want to, I don't want to lie to this little kid. Like nobody wants to li likes to lie. Yeah, <laughs> especially because he's already like being so sweet, and you can tell how much he looks up to him. Um, someone's in my comments saying, and also like Nico and Bianca just got into this world; they don't deserve that. They have had no time to process, which like. I think Percy also feels bad for Nico because of that. He's seeing a 10 year old kid that nobody is looking out for. He's already had to be the person to tell him that his sister was not going to be like his family anymore, essentially. Um, he's been put in a very hard situation with Nico from the very beginning. And mm -hmm. that is a lot to hold the responsibility of as a 13 year old himself. It, it reminds me a lot of what we were talking about last time with like scapegoat golden child thing where the scapegoat like is very adultified or like parentified where we we're dealing with like adult decisions in the way that a golden child doesn't usually have to and like Nico is not the golden child in this situation but it's the same sort of thing where he knows that what could happen to his sister going on this quest and he doesn't want to like you know, scare the shit out of this little kid. He wants him to stay like this innocent kid for as long as he possibly can. And so he doesn't want to like be aggressive about it and tell him like your sister might die on this quest because it's really dangerous for us to go. And someone we already know that at least two people are supposed to die. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't want to tell this like little kid something like that because he's a little kid. Yeah. It's like, how do you balance that of like trying to tell trying to reassure them that you'll do whatever you can to keep them safe without giving them false hope but also not like kind of breaking the like young innocentness they have about their entire life so far and making them be scared about something that's way too adult for what they deal with mm -hmm. um so that's an impossible situation <laughs> My comments are saying, um, which makes me mad at Hades for taking them out of the casino just so he could have an upper hand. Yep. Yeah, it's, they weren't ready at all. They weren't, like, and I know no demigods at this point get any sort of lead into their life. They're just kind of thrown into it. But the fact that they were found by Grover, Percy, Talia, and Annabeth, like, you would think that they were going to get some sort of gentler interruption or in, in, gentler introduction before everything went wrong. It and, also, it also yeah, makes yeah. me mad at Luke and his people because they went and like attacked them at that school just to try to kidnap Percy. They didn't actually care about Nico and Bianca and what would happen to them. And because they chose these two kids as like their little guinea pigs to bait Percy, um, they ended up getting wrapped up in all of this stuff. Like if they wouldn't have chose Bianca and Nico, then they the two of them would still be at that military school and they would be fine. Yeah. None of this stuff would happen to them. But because they used them in their stupid plan, they got sucked into all of this stuff when they shouldn't have had to deal with that yeah um let's see so after this interaction with nico is where we kind of end the chapter with percy knows that the hunters are going to the van to go get driven off on the first leg of their journey and that um he doesn't know how he's going to keep up with them at first and then his pegasus blackjack comes um let's see uh yes as base like 
actually thinking about the book like this makes me yeah um it's it and i love that this interpretation of the show especially if they get to titan's curse is going to be a great season um but we've said this since the beginning is that the new interpretation that disney's doing actually makes it kids like it makes it age appropriate children whereas logan lerman like they rewrote in sea of monsters they said something like your 21st birthday is when the prophecy is going to take place just to fudge the dates a little bit here mm -hmm. and um so having kids be the ones doing all of the action definitely shows you how big the stakes were always on these children yeah like if we get to titan's curse which i don't know why we wouldn't at this point with how success yeah. successful the show is and how good that season is if we get to that point we're gonna watch a 12 year old kid get cast as bianca that we know is going to be electrocuted to death mm -hmm. and we're going to have to like watch that yeah watch, not only watch that but also watch percy like re a reaction to that and like be looking for her and, and all the stuff that happens when that happens and nico's reaction to it later yeah it's just brutal as, as it should be like that's the whole point that they're trying to make here that the world is so brutal to these kids in a way that's completely unfair but that's why the the movies are so stupid <laughs> is yeah. that changing their ages like that just takes away all of the meaning that is supposed to be in the story yeah um a good kind of like moment for me in these chapters we read that was very emblematic of the scapegoat and golden child journey together was while they were at the meeting talking about who's gonna go um somebody brings up the line about you know like somebody's gonna die by a parent's hand and um somebody at the table says like oh whose parents would want to kill them though and talia and percy look at each other like um hi <laughs> like us uh we're the ones and um like they both know what danger they're in it's just their reactions to things are different and that's really what's happening with a scapegoat and a golden child we are the fawn response and you guys are like the fight and the flight response at the same time yeah yeah i was gonna say something but i don't remember what i was gonna say anymore <laughs> yeah, but... um, oh what i was gonna say was first off blackjack is the pegasus that percy saw when he was a little kid oh. and that makes him think he's hallucinating mm -hmm. Um, for all those years, and so I, I honestly hope that in season two or three even, they have a scene where he realizes that that horse was real and that he wasn't delusional for his entire childhood, that that actually was, he was actually there. Um, I like, everyone likes Blackjack, but it's, I like Blackjack a lot because his, it's his own little, like, helper. Um, but I also just, like, love this moment for... Percy, because it just kind of shows his personiness, I guess, is that this moment um, he's leaving to go on a quest and he has Annabeth's hat, Riptide, and that's it. Yeah, like the clothes on his back. He has no money. He has no food. He, he has nothing. He mentions that he's look like as he leaves with Blackjack the first time, he mentions his shield is back there, still broken and unusable. Yeah. Like Tyson's shield got broken in the fight, so he can't even bring that. He is he has absolutely nothing. And he's just leaving anyway because like he has to go. Like he has to go and help Annabeth and he's just gonna go. Even if he has like nothing on him at all. And he has no idea how he's going to find them, how he's going to follow them without them realizing that he's there, how he's going to like eat, yeah. like not like get dehydrated, just like the most simplest things. He doesn't know how he's going to do it, but he just leaves anyway, because that's just what he's like. He doesn't, he just doesn't care when it comes to that. It's like, no, I need to go. Like, this is what's important. So I'm just going to go now. I don't know, honestly, if there's another demigod at camp that would actually do that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if even Annabeth would do that, if she would just leave like that with no planning, no idea what you're going to do and nothing and just go. Yeah. Because that's just something that a lot of the kids at camp wouldn't want to do because it's just so dangerous. 
and they would just think like oh but they don't want me to leave and it's like i don't care mm-hmm. like i don't care if they're going to get mad at me for leaving i'm going anyway because i need to protect my friend yeah um, well and percy being so anti-system is kind of the way that that ends up working out because talia's fawn response is I know that these gods value valor. They value excellence, especially military and strategic excellence. And those are the things that literally bring you to paradise in our afterlife. Um, Mm -hmm. So she just goes with that. And she goes with it to the point where she can't see that she's not always the best person to storm the gates. Um, Percy, on the other hand, since his motivation is his care for people, it's his love for the people around him, he's going to do what's right because that's just who he is. Mm -hmm. Um, He doesn't care about the value system. He doesn't care about the hierarchy. He's just, he's just who he is. And he's like, he doesn't care about the way things are supposed to be at all. Yeah. And like similar to their whole capture the flag thing, like he will follow the plan or follow the rules for as long as as long as they like work for him Mm -hmm. but as long as they don't but when they start not working for him he's just gonna change his mind and he's not gonna like stick to the god's rules just because that's the way that they're supposed to do it percy's Mm -hmm. feedback loop is people aren't gonna care even if i do everything perfectly and follow all of the rules so i might as well just do what i want anyways yeah yeah, like, I know people make this point, but I, I still think it's fun that Percy breaks the gods' rules mm-hmm. and Annabeth breaks camp rules. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, like, the human rules. Like, Percy will sit there and eat dinner by himself every day at camp because that's what he's supposed to do. And when Annabeth breaks that rule in the fourth book, he's like, oh my god, what is happening? <laughs> like, he's all, like, shaking and nervous. Like, he's nervous that she's going to get in trouble. Because for him, like, he's more scared of breaking human rules because of having abusive people in his life. But when it comes to, like, the gods, he's like, these people are stupid. So if they're doing something that doesn't make sense, that's going to lead to somebody I care about getting hurt, I'm just going to break the rules because I don't care. Yeah, I would rather help somebody than to just do what you're supposed to do. <laughs> and especially in this book that is, like, the the theme of, like, the story in this book is about Hercules. Mm -hmm. Um, That's definitely different from how Hercules was. And but that's, that's Percy, he, um, he really doesn't like Hercules by the end of this book. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) We can get into that later, too. I I, I've said this before, Hercules is one of my blind spots in Greek mythology. So um, this one's probably going to challenge me to get more up to date on that. And I've already a little bit here and there, like, I know Hercules took on the burden for Atlas at one point, which is probably something they've already referenced here. But um, yeah, it's just, it'll be interesting for me with the mythology journey. Also, because the mythology isn't as prominent as it has been in some of the earlier books. Rick doesn't set it up the same now that he kind of expects we know this world. Yeah. And like, oh, the thing with Percy leaving too that reminds me is how people like Athena Mm -hmm. would see what he did as like really bad Mm -hmm. and like wrong because he was like disobeying their rules or whatever and like taking this huge risk and especially because what he did is like not strategic at all. Mm -hmm. Like he has no idea what he's doing. He just ends up leaving. He doesn't have like a plan or anything like that. He just goes and i think that's one of those funny things where they would see him doing this as a bad thing as a way for him being like insolent or or like you know problematic or something like that Mm -hmm. but it's like i'm leaving so that i can save your daughter's life exactly i feel like that should be more important to you than (laughs) than whether i had a good plan or whether i followed the rules but it's just that whole sort of like scapegoaty thing that he that is the right decision to make and i think it's so funny that people will try to like be like he's in the wrong for joining the quest or something and it's like shut up (laughs) there's there's just no way that that could possibly be the i just think it's so funny how this world works that they see him as so dangerous because he makes the choice to 
go on something like this to save somebody who's in mortal danger that he cares a lot about. Mm -hmm. And because he does that, instead of just like following the rules, he's seen as like a really dangerous person where they're like arguing at the end of this book about killing him or not. And it's like, that's what, out of everything that's going on right now with demigods, like one of your children is actively trying to destroy the entire world. Um, but this is the thing that makes you upset is that he won't follow your rules and will like hold his own personal loyalty sometimes over like the good of everyone, you know, actually be a hero. This yeah. is what a hero should actually do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see. So that takes us to the end of the chapter. Um, next week, we're going to read chapters nine and 10, um, which chapter nine, it says, I learned how to grow zombies. Um, let's see. And then chapter 10 was the title of that one. And chapter 10 is I break a few rocket ships. So yeah. And I don't remember fully what happens in these. So it's always a journey for me of rediscovering the books a little bit. And um, I don't know, it's it's kind of exciting because I do remember some things that happen vaguely, but not a lot. Yeah, I don't remember, like from this point on, the things I remember is the stuff that happens in the desert. And mm -hmm. then other than that, I don't really remember anything besides that Annabeth's dad gets involved at like the very end. Um, mm -hmm. And the like at the end of the book is about the council, like the winter council where they're arguing about stuff. Um, but I don't even remember, I don't remember anything else. And I don't even remember what necessarily happens during those scenes, except for Bianca, obviously. Um, but that's pretty much it. And so the rest of it is just like fun to rediscover it. We can leave it off with this good thought because it's a good one. So in my comments, talking about this makes me understand how sinister the gods offering Percy godhood was, because um, then he would actually have to follow the rules. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, there's definitely more rules to the divinity. And like, it, it's almost grooming too, um, because it's like, well, we could never beat you. So join us. Yeah, it's that's literally like an abuse tactic is like oh you made me look bad and so you're th you're threatening to me because you're make you're actually holding me accountable mm -hmm. and so what if i get you to join me instead to make us one of you so that you will no longer do that like in the real life version of that would be like if you're like in a group of friends like somebody being like oh you can like sleep over at my house and then i won't tell people about this or that or whatever and you end up like going along with what they're doing, even though you don't like it because you want to be part of the group or something. Yeah. Um, that's like something that happens a lot. And that's basically what they're doing with him is they're just trying to silence him and think that if he's one of them, that, the, that he'll stop critiquing them. Mm -hmm. Which is why Zeus is like very displeased when he's like, no. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, like, I mean, at least in the myths, we know these gods don't take disrespect very well. Mm -hmm. um, and it almost seems like time and less people believing them has softened them more to that in a way, like begrudgingly so, mm -hmm. but it has. And then we finally get Percy who's just flat out like, no, you guys are at best neglectful and at worst totally abusive. Um, so pay your child support um actually acknowledge us establish your paternity like all of that we make the harry potter comparison all the time but literally like any character in harry potter okay. if they were offered something like this they would have said yes per and, uh, harry does he, he yeah, becomes, becomes part of the ministry he becomes a fucking cop and and like i think Hermione at one point like becomes the minister of magic like many yeah. years in the future or something like that so they literally become part of the system that horribly traumatized them their whole life but yeah like that's like the thing that I think about is like if a, if a character in Harry Potter was offered something like this they would have said yes right away not even thought about it and then that would have ended things because the gods want it to be like oh this like just happened and it was all Luke's fault and now that he's gone everything can just go back to normal right <laughs> like they do in harry potter yeah. and these and this kid like it, percy is like no like that's not what happened here this is your fault 
-hmm. you made this happen and they're like wait a second <laughs> Yeah. Like you're, you're not being you're like not like letting all of our faults go and you're actually making us think about the mistakes we make i don't like this <laughs> <laughs> yes accountability that's why we like percy he 100 just is like i don't like this system and i'm gonna change it and i love that rick gave us that fulfilling ending as a neurodivergent person like of we all see the problems with this world we all want it to be better and we are powerless percy gets given the power and he does the right thing immediately mm -hmm. <laughs> um so we can leave it on that note because i have to get william to bed um and yeah we're doing nine and ten for next week any press news that comes out about the kids or about the film production we'll let you guys know and we'll mm -hmm. talk about it um yeah and also if you happen to be a person that's anywhere close to where they're filming like we said in the beginning you're allowed to take pictures and photos and stuff you can yes. even tag us in them <laughs> like but just a, be respectful of filming spaces there's even a there's a twitter account that covers vancouver filming it i forget what the like the name of it is but there is one that's dedicated and all they do is post when something is filming and they usually don't know what it is um, but like that day when they were filming, somebody asked like, what's filming on this one corner? And then they retweeted it later to be like, oh, it's Percy Jackson <laughs> um, when people figured out what it was. And so if you want to find if you live in Vancouver and you want to like try to watch filming, that's a that's a good account to try to find. And, and if you're free to go run over and see if it's them. <laughs> yes, but don't skip school, children, and don't don't step into the filming space. <laughs> also, like if you want to watch our videos some more during class, that's also fine um but what don't skip school you yeah. can watch us during school math class school only entirely <laughs> math isn't important we could get ai to do that um that's the only class you're allowed to skip be fully present for your english classes and your art classes yes